This week on the agenda, inside Azerbaijan, we speak exclusively to the country's economy minister as the capital, Baku, gears up to host this year's COP29 climate summit. Later this year, Azerbaijan will host the UN's COP29 climate summit. It's one of the top 10 most fossil fuel dependent countries in the world. But that's all set to change as Azerbaijan looks to transition to a greener future. It's one of the many issues I discussed in an exclusive interview with economy minister Mikhail Jabarov. But I began by asking him whether the real risk to global growth is not climate concerns, but a simple lack of trust. Absolutely. Uh, I think uh, global economy and global growth needs uh, predictability. And in that sense, on the um, um, growing um, security challenges, uh, unilateral actions of uh, individual uh, member states of the um, trading uh, system uh, clearly uh, does impact negatively uh, economic growth. And in that sense, I think the uh, importance uh, of a uh, forum uh, like uh, this one is exactly in uh, having a right platform for public and uh, private sector uh, to come across, uh, share uh, the uh, views, uh, and uh, definitely more predictability, security, and stability would never hurt uh, for economic growth and development, but in fact would be a reason that will uh, fuel it. That's a big ask <laughs> to have pr predictability because, of course, I know the markets um, hate uncertainty. Uh, as, as the world goes greener, how is Azerbaijan diversifying the economy away from fossil fuels? Uh, we have been uh, investing uh, systemically, both institutionally and also on, in terms of economic uh, uh, policies and infrastructure uh, in ensuring uh, smooth energy transition. Uh, according to our national goals, uh, by 2030, 30% 30, uh, 30 uh, of our uh, energy demand will need to be uh, covered uh, from uh, renewable sources. We are well uh, ahead of that uh, uh, plan. Uh, we are open uh, for uh, cooperation uh, with uh, investors, and because Azerbaijan is a traditional uh, energy uh, producer, we uh, have a good uh, array, both of international energy companies active and investing in renewable projects in Azerbaijan, but also national uh, champions. So uh, uh, it is of no coincidence uh, in that regard that uh, our country has been uh, entrusted uh, decision by consensus to host COP29, uh, a task that we uh, take uh, absolutely responsible and uh, seriously, and we uh, seek to contribute to uh, this uh, process. Uh, talking of um, uh, energy transition and uh, renewable energy production, I think I also want to mention that uh, while, as we speak, uh, we continue to be a pan-European uh, supplier uh, in terms of the fossil fuels, both uh, oil uh, and natural uh, gas, uh, it is only natural that we are um, planning a, a project aimed at exporting um, green uh, energy to uh, European uh, Union, and this is a regional uh, project uh, initiated by Azerbaijan jointly with uh, Georgia, uh, Bulgaria, Romania, now Hungary is joining, and uh, across the Caspian, as uh, we are also belonging to the Central Asian and Caspian region, we uh, are in a very good uh, and productive discussions with countries across the Caspian also to link them uh, into that. This project envisages uh, production of uh, wind and solar energy, uh, in Azerbaijan and uh, other uh, countries and uh, transmission to European market via Black Sea, uh, Seabed uh, Cable, which will be another contribution to um, uh, global energy security and transition. So lots of plans in terms of collaboration and, and partnerships. You've mentioned regions there in terms of Europe um, and, and nations um, with interest in, in the Caspian Sea. Um, which, where else would you like to forge partnerships? Where are some exciting projects in the pipeline? We have strong uh, um, existing and growing relationship with uh, multiple uh, partners. If you look at the trade uh, balance of Azerbaijan, uh, our major trading partners are uh, European Union, China, uh, Russian Federation, of course, Turkey, Central Asian states, uh, and uh, GCC uh, countries. 
uh, and that does represent in a way uh, also the um, uh, f structure of our uh, mutual investments. Um, Azerbaijan is also located on the crossroads uh, of uh, various transport routes uh, and uh, clearly east-west, uh, the uh, route that connects, actually the shortest uh, route that uh, connects uh, China to uh, Europe passes through Central Asian states across Caspian and via uh, Azerbaijan. Uh, similarly, same is true with respect to north-south. Uh, uh, and uh, that uh, our geography, in a way, uh, also uh, defines uh, our uh, economic uh, partnership. But you talk about forging closer ties within Europe. So what's going on with you in France at the moment? Uh, Azerbaijan, as you uh, know, has been a country which uh, has been uh, suffering from uh, occupation uh, of its territories in a blunt violation of uh, international law. Uh, territorial integrity of my country has been uh, violated. And uh, uh, there has been times when one person out of uh, eight uh, in a country has been either a refugee or internally displaced uh, person as a result uh, of that occupation. Uh, notwithstanding the four resolutions of UN Security uh, Council, uh, which demanded um, unconditional uh, withdrawal uh, of Armenian troops from territory of Azerbaijan, uh, these uh, have not been uh, enforced. And uh, notwithstanding all the efforts for over a quarter of the century by mediators, uh, including uh, France, uh, and uh, therefore Azerbaijan uh, acting uh, in uh, line with international order and exercising its uh, right of self-defense uh, has restored territorial integrity. I also have to uh, underline that uh, our position for territorial integrity is consistent with international law uh, and uh, is applied to all uh, 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 disputes uh, which arise uh, in international law. Same is true with respect to our position to uh, One China uh, policy, as an example. Uh, uh, and yes, Azerbaijan stands um, uh, firmly on the basis of international law and uh, against any attempts to fuel new confrontation in the region, because we believe that it's a time for peace and uh, prosperity, and therefore unilateral uh, actions aimed at fueling revanchism and uh, especially after having a chance uh, to be a mediator, being unsuccessful mediator, uh, not a single square meter uh, of uh, occupied lands was uh, liberated as a result of the uh, uh, mediation, being a Monday morning uh, quarterback. Uh, uh, we do not believe it's a constructive approach to the process. Let's talk about trade. Let's talk about investments. So what big investments have there been into Azerbaijan from China and indeed the other way around? Uh, China is an uh, important and growing trading uh, partner uh, of Azerbaijan. Uh, our trade volume uh, last year exceeded uh, $3 billion and we recorded um, uh, growth in double digits. Uh, it continues. Uh, we uh, have a permanent uh, trade representative office uh, uh, in uh, China. Uh, uh, our uh, relationship um, continue in a field of uh, investments. As we speak, a number of uh, Chinese uh, companies are uh, active in carrying out the projects in various fields of Azerbaijan. These include renewable energy, industrial uh, production, uh, cooperation in the field of industrial clusters. Uh, um, I already mentioned the a transportation uh, route uh, that uh, links and provides for a safe and reliable and speedy uh, uh, transport of uh, cargo and transit of uh, cargo uh, between uh, our countries or through uh, Azerbaijan in uh, both uh, directions. Um, and this is all based on excellent political relationship, which exists, as uh, I already mentioned, Azerbaijan supports the principle of uh, one uh, China, and that's uh, also a very strong uh, a foundation for uh, our uh, relationship. Let's talk about future engines of growth. A uh, big theme at Davos has been that the benefits, along with the risks of artificial intelligence. So let's talk about technology and, and what AI means to, to Azerbaijan, your digital transformation. H how do you see it happening? How important is it for Azerbaijan's economy? 
Well, it's absolutely uh, important, I think, for uh, any economy uh, in the world, and Azerbaijan is not an exception. Uh, we have been recognizing the uh, uh, necessity to act uh, and promote uh, also institutionally. World Economic Forum, I must say, has been a very good partner. Azerbaijan was the first uh, country in uh, CIS uh, to uh, end in the region, indeed, to set up a, a force um, affiliated center uh, for a force industrial revolution, which, along uh, with other uh, public and governmental uh, and private uh, agencies, is spearheading the uh, uh, increase of the speed of digitalization uh, um, in uh, specifically in economy, but also in other uh, areas of Azerbaijan. As we speak, we are developing. Uh, uh, local uh, generative uh, AI. Uh, similarly, um, AI solutions are uh, being uh, applied by our uh, leading blue chip uh, chips companies, uh, both state-owned and uh, uh, private-owned. But this is a, a space where the uh, speed of change uh, is a uh, speed of uh, light. So I think uh, continuous uh, uh, investment and raising awareness also in terms of the uh, providing the right bridges between uh, education and uh, economy, uh, human capital formation are necessary uh, elements uh, in uh, order to not only to stay in the race but to uh, make sure that uh, it impacts uh, positively the uh, economic development and prosperity of the nation. Of course, Azerbaijan is going to be hosting COP29 later this year. Um, the second country in a row to hold the meeting whose economy is underpinned by oil. Um, and significant gas reserves. What's your goal for COP? Uh, our goal, uh, Azerbaijan has been uh, interested in uh, COP29. Uh, uh, this is a um, uh, process uh, uh, of which uh, we are um, uh, honored uh, uh, to uh, chair uh, and preside over uh, this uh, year. Uh, um, our focus uh, and theme of this uh, year subject will be around climate uh, financing. I think it's extremely uh, important. And the reason being that mainly, uh, and I think we have to give credit to very successful uh, uh, presidency of uh, United Arab uh, Emirates uh, within COP28, the results achieved there, many questions which start with what to do have been, uh, uh, we believe, answered. But we have been lagging behind in terms of answering to the question how to deliver, how to do, and uh, financing and uh, mechanisms being in the center of them. Azerbaijan is uniquely uh, positioned uh, because of its history uh, of uh, both of being on the crossroads. You already mentioned it being um, probably one of the uh, oldest nations where industrial production of uh, energy, uh, uh, of oil, have started. And similarly, we are ready to uh, play our role especially in uh, bridging uh, north and uh, south, uh, uh, specifically also with the purpose of uh, financial uh, mechanisms, uh, and uh, uh, supporting uh, and continuing the uh, good uh, initiatives and basis on which consensus is already there. We are seeking working hand by hand with uh, all uh, stakeholders to uh, contribute new, new initiatives. So COP29 will be uh, an exciting uh, journey. Uh, uh, and we will do uh, our uh, best to um, uh, take a step uh, further from uh, where we are in this process. We've talked about the themes that have been covered here in Davos. Climate change, financing, artificial intelligence, um, increasing geopolitical tensions. If there was one thing that, that, that everyone would change as a result of this meeting in Davos, what would you like it to be? Well, if we have to uh, go for uh, one thing, uh, I, I guess uh, this is um, uh, this wouldn't be um, okay. I will say it the way it will be. Uh, uh, to me, uh, uh, this will be um, adherence to the uh, stated uh, principles to real actions, and that's all what it takes. Uh, all it takes is to. Uh, uh, act as we uh, are saying that we are acting and have an uh, open uh, dialogue within that framework of uh, international law, rule and order uh, that exists both for uh, economic and non-economic uh, issues in, uh, uh, in our planet. 
It's hard to pick one, isn't it? Because you've got quite a big shopping list. I did my best. <laughs> thank you so I thank much, you. Minister. Thank you very much. Still to come here on the agenda, a greener future. We look in more detail at what COP29 will really mean for Azerbaijan and the rest of the world. We are all connected. Across borders, across continents, connected by ideas, a shared humanity. Stay connected. Welcome back to the agenda and let's continue our look inside Azerbaijan and especially when it will next be right in the global spotlight hosting the COP29 climate summit in November. Here with me in the studio is Kave Gilampour, Vice President for International Strategies at the Centre for Climate and Energy Solutions. But let's start with talking about why COP29 is important for Azerbaijan and for the region. Well, thank you for inviting me. COP29 is going to be the first COP that's been held in that part of the world. And I think it's important for a number of reasons. Obviously, for Azerbaijan, it's going to be a big deal. The spotlight of the world will be on it in, in, dur during the whole of 2024, but especially in November. But also, there's a number of countries in that region that have unique biodiversities, unique uh, environments that are particularly vulnerable to climate change, which tend to get overlooked. So I think it's a chance for them to spotlight uh, th those considerations. But of course, it's also going to invite a lot of pressure on the region to show leadership and climate ambition as well. Especially because history does seem to be repeating itself. In, it's another oil and gas rich nation hosting um, the world's most important climate gathering. Um, is that a help or is it a hindrance? Well, you're, you're right, of course, but I, I think this will be close to my 20th COP that I'll attend. And probably at least half of those have been in countries that have fossil fuel resources of some kind. So I think it's interesting that it tends to be when it's in developing countries that it becomes particularly an issue. And that's something to reflect on COP26 in the UK, for example. The UK is both an oil and gas producer and historically coal. So it's certainly not anything new. I think similarly to COP28, what, what I was advising in advance of that is let's judge by the outcome. And I think the UAE presidency was vindicated there. So let's hope that Azerbaijan also steps up. But also, they, being an oil and gas producer helped the UAE in terms of regional relationships and fostering trust with countries in a similar position. And I think it's arguable that the outcome of COP28 wouldn't have been achieved had the UAE not been an oil and gas producer itself. So let's wait and see what Azerbaijan delivers, I think. Well, earlier this month, um, the incoming COP president, Mukhtar Babayev, said green growth was a priority for Azerbaijan um, in, in the decades ahead. I mean, do you, do you think that that really means anything? Because I mean, isn't that really just what every country needs to do? Yes, I mean, you're right. It is what every country needs to do. The science is clear. In order to stay within the 1.5 degrees Celsius limit of the Paris Agreement, we need to achieve net zero emissions globally by 2050. And that means halving emissions by 2030 globally. So indeed, every country has to contribute to that. So the statement's very welcome, but we really will need to judge by actions rather than words. And as I say, I think Azerbaijan is going to be very much under pressure to show leadership in that regard. Do you think Azerbaijan needs to up its commitments um, to the UN to, to cut emissions, I mean, the national defined contributions, maybe to do that ahead of COP, would that be a signal everyone will be welcoming? Again, you're right. Every country is expected to put on the table a new climate target or nationally determined contribution in the first quarter of 2025, and that includes Azerbaijan. The Paris Agreement requires those climate targets to be successively more ambitious. So Azerbaijan's current target is a 40% reduction compared to 1990 levels by 2050. 
that is not a very ambitious target globally. As I said, the world needs to transition to net zero by 2050. So I think Azerbaijan will be under a lot of pressure. I think it would show real leadership for them to come forward with a new climate target early in advance of the COP. And my suspicion is that they will, uh, will, they will do that. We've talked about why COP is important, why this COP is, is important for the region. I, I wonder how COP29 might change Azerbaijan's position on the global stage? Well, I think there's a, a number of reasons countries would be interested in hosting a, a summit like this. One is a commitment for action on climate change and vulnerability domestically to the impact. As I say, I think that region in particular has a number of unique uh, challenges that it's facing on climate change. But of course, it does raise the profile of the country in terms of a leader uh, multilaterally. COPs are one of the biggest events that happen each year. World leaders are usually expected to attend. Um, but with that positive aspect also invites a lot of international pressure and scrutiny. So I think Azerbaijan will, will need to step up and, and raise its ambition as well. You talk about raising ambitions. You also mentioned that the region has some quite unique um, climate challenges. Mm. Um, talk me through those. Well, for example, uh, Georgia, which is a neighboring country, has one of the highest biodiversity rates in, in uh, continental Europe, uh, which are, are under threat from climate change. Um, glaciers are retreating, uh, sources of water for uh, the renewable resource of um, uh, hydro energy is being reduced in the region. So these are all having knock-on effects. There's impacts on agriculture. Uh, so these are all things that the countries are experiencing. And also their, their workforce will need to transition in a just transition towards renewable energy. And that's going to be particularly a challenge for Azerbaijan because it does have a significant reliance on fossil fuel production. So those are the problems, those, those are the challenges. Let's look at what the potential outcomes could be because already people are talking about COP29 as being the, the finance COP. So what breakthroughs are, are, are really needed and will reality meet expectations? Yeah, so COP29, the main mandated deliverable for COP29 is to agree a new climate target which in the jargon is called a new collective quantified goal. As you will be aware, there's been this goal of 100 billion a year in climate finance that was agreed at the Copenhagen COP back in 2009. COP29 is expected to agree a new global target. But nobody's even meeting that target. Well, I, 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 I think developed countries would argue that they have met that goal, although uh, they met it late after the 2020 target year. There's an expectation that that target will need to increase beyond the 100 billion. The challenge we face is that COP28 made it clear that we need almost six trillion in climate finance by 2030 to implement existing climate targets. So obviously there's a huge disconnection between that 100 billion and the six trillion. And that's not going to be met by public sector finance in developed countries. So a big part of the conversation at COP29 will be how do we reform the international financial system so as to stimulate the global finance flows to go in the right direction. It's the numbers you're, you're throwing out there just get bigger and bigger and mm. then seem less and less achievable. Well, the, the six trillion figure includes the, the reality of global investment. So if you look at the amount of uh, investment and finance flows globally a year, that's well within that range. The challenge and the, one of the goals of the Paris Agreement is to make sure that all finance flows and investments globally are aligned with the target of keeping temperatures within the 1.5 limit, but also achieving global climate resilience. So it's really sending a signal to private investors, multilateral development banks, international financial institutions to align all of their investment decisions over time to deliver on the, on the goals of the Paris Agreement. But public sector finance from those countries that can afford it will be hugely important because that's a reliable source of finance for climate action, particularly for developing countries. And the South-South cooperation is something that's increasing globally and will be part of that conversation at COP29. And that, that conversation will be wide-ranging because mm. it's how, how to get to those figures, which, mm. which I suppose are, are the sticking point. But, but at COP28, um, everyone seemed to agree to this world's first global stock take mm. um, of the Paris Agreement. What do you understand by that? Uh, and why is it significant? 
Yeah. So the Paris Agreement at its heart has something called the uh, ambition cycle. So every five years countries come together and they're mandated to look at how they've progressed to achieving the goals of the Paris Agreement, but also to inform the next round of climate targets, which are due every five years. And as I say, the next one will be in the first quarter of 2025. So COP28 did that, and it agreed a number of global sectoral targets to be achieved. So things like tripling renewable energy by 2030 and doubling energy efficiency, transitioning away from fossil fuels in a just and equitable way. These are clear global signals that were agreed but the the challenge is that they're global and the climate targets are national and they're nationally determined so what we will need to see is what the collective level of ambition of those climate targets are in 2025 whether they do take us closer to staying within the 1.5 limit but also how countries have responded to this call to do things like tripling renewable energy and moving away from fossil fuels a lot of what we're talking about marks 2025 as being the big year and I wonder if that plays into what we're hearing from some quite experienced negotiators who are suggesting that COP29 is going to be lower profile than COP28 with more focus on agreeing this new like longer term quantified goal on finance that we've been talking about. So what are you expecting? Well, you're right. I mean, COP28 had a very large agenda, which was predicted by uh, the Paris Agreement in terms of this five-year cycle. So it was always um, sort of uh, toted as being this big, uh, significant COP. But every COP is more important than the last because we need to maintain pressure and momentum towards the transition and delivering on the Paris Agreement goals. COP29, while it might be small in terms of its agenda and mandated deliverables, agreeing the finance target will be absolutely vital because this will determine how comfortable countries are, how much confidence particularly developing countries have in putting on the table ambitious targets, but also knowing and having confidence that they will then subsequently be able to implement them because just raising targets on paper doesn't really achieve anything if they're not followed through. So while the agenda might be more streamlined than it was for Dubai, the importance of it can't be underestimated. It will really set the tone and for the ambition that can be achieved in, in the subsequent year. So the agenda might be streamlined, but it is still very much global, although you have said that, of course, there are lots of national targets that, that have to be agreed. And, of course, this year is probably one of the biggest years for, for elections that we would have seen. I think half the world's population um, could potentially be going to the polls this year. Yeah. There could be changes of leadership. Um, what impact could that have on the climate challenge and climate action that needs to follow? Well, 2024 is a very important year because not only do countries have to spend this year actively developing their new climate targets and taking into account the outcome from COP28, they also have to enhance their cooperation to do that, which is another one of the mandates that, was, that came out of COP28. You're right, a number of countries have elections, including we're sat in a studio here in London, including in the UK. But what polling has shown consistently, including in various by-elections that have happened over the last 12 months, is that the public's commitment and understanding of the climate challenge and commitment to net zero is holding strong. So as people around the world increasingly see the impacts of climate change, I think they understand that it needs to be tackled. The real challenge is how we do that and how we transition in a way that minimizes the impact on things like jobs but actually highlights the opportunities. Um, and the future shows that the, the, the world has a lot of opportunity in terms of the growth of green jobs and the potential in, in that. And I think governments need to highlight that to their electorates. Carver Gillenport, thank you very much. Thank you. You can watch every episode of The Agenda in full on CGTN Europe's YouTube channel. And for exclusive extra content from me, my guests and the rest of the team, don't forget to check out at The Agenda Show on TikTok. Coming up on a future agenda, the nuclear option. Is it really the answer to a clean fuel future? But for now, from me, Juliet Mann, and from all the Agenda team here in London, goodbye.